morning and welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. At this meeting, CPSC staff will brief the commission on draft notice of proposed rulemaking to address risk of carbon monoxide poisoning from residential gas furnaces and, and boilers. According to the package before us, there's an average of 21 deaths per year from carbon monoxide leaks from these appliances. This is not a new problem. Staff has been working for more than 20 years to address this hazard. Taking uh, part uh, in multiple voluntary standards working groups, publishing a request for information, hosting a, a forum in 2014 to gather information about the availability and feasibility of CO sensors for use in gas furnaces and boilers. You know, this has been a long effort and I appreciate the staff's dedication and work on this. In a moment, I'm going to turn this meeting over to the staff so they can brief us. Once they've completed the briefing, each commissioner will have 10 minutes to ask questions with multiple rounds if necessary. As a reminder, if you have questions that address the agency's legal authority or other legal advice, please do ask them at this time. We can hold a closed executive session at the end of the briefing upon request. Briefing us today, we have uh, Ronald Jordan, project manager for gas furnace and bo uh, boiler carbon monoxide rulemaking, and David uh, DiMatteo, thank you, uh, an attorney in the office of the general counsel. Also joining us today are uh, Jason Levine, uh, the executive director, Austin Schlick, general counsel, Dwayne Ray, deputy executive director, Dan Weiss, assistant general counsel, and Pam Stone, who's acting as commission secretary. I'm going to now turn the microphone over. Uh, please start. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Ronald Jordan, as the chairman said, and I am the project manager for the gas appliance CO sensor project. This morning, uh, my colleague Dave DiMatteo and I are going to brief you on staff's efforts to prepare this notice of proposed uh, rulemaking for the safety of gas furnaces and gas boilers. If we have our slides up, we can go to the next slide. I'm just going to wait for my slide deck to queue up. That's fine, please. without it. Okay. And that's fine. Um, I'll just give you a brief overline outline of what we're going to cover this morning. Um, we're going to go through the rulemaking process, which will be covered by Dave. Then I'll, we'll get into the product history, a little bit of the background or at the hazard analysis that we conducted, um, compliance actions that have been taken for these groups of products, um, existing voluntary standards and our assessment of those standards, as well as our proposed rule and then the economic analysis that supports that. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dave. Um, if the slide deck is ready, we can go ahead. But if not, you have it, Dave. I'll just proceed without the slide deck up yet. Hi, my name is David Dimitri. I'm the Office of the General Counsel. I'm going to provide you a general over, uh, overview of the rulemaking requirements under the Consumer Product Safety Act, also known as the CPSA. Section 7 of the CPSA authorizes the commission to issue consumer product safety standards that consist of the following types of requirements, performance requirements and requirements for warnings or instructions. Those requirements must be reasonably necessary to prevent or reduce an unreasonable risk of injury associated with the product. A proposed rule under the CPSA is also required to provide proposed regulatory text to describe the regulatory alternatives the commission considered, conduct a preliminary regulatory analysis, provide preliminary findings, and provide opportunity for written and oral comments. And under the CPSA, the preliminary regulatory analysis has to uh, consider the potential benefits and costs of the rule and who's likely to receive the benefits and bear the cost. 
and also the alternatives to the proposal and the reasons why they were not chosen. Under section nine of the CPSA, the commission needs to make a number of preliminary findings for an NPR. The degree and nature of risk intended to be addressed by the rule, the approximate number of products subject to the rule, need of the public and effect of the rule on utility, cost and availability of the product, other means of achieving the objective of the rule while minimizing adverse effects on competition, manufacturing and commercial practices. The rule is reasonably necessary to reduce an unreasonable risk of injury. The rule is in the public interest. The expected benefits of the rule bear a reasonable relationship to the cost. The rule imposes the least burdensome requirement that prevents or adequately addresses the risk of injury. And finally, under section nine, there also needs to be a preliminary finding by the commission for any uh, existing standard that's adopted and implemented voluntary standard, the commission must find either the voluntary standard is not likely to eliminate or adequately address the risk of injury or reduce it, or substantial compliance with the voluntary stand standard is unlikely. And at this point, I will turn it back over to Ron to give you an overview of the background for the rule and the proposed requirements. Okay. Well, I see we have our slide deck up, so I'm going to let our slide deck catch up with the briefing. If you could Go to slide eight. There you go. So the products that our rule covers, our proposed rule covers, include uh, gas-fired central furnaces, gas boilers, uh, a subset of those tankless gas boilers, uh, wall furnaces, and floor furnaces. And throughout this briefing, just to simplify things, we're going to refer to those products as gas furnaces and boilers because they encompass. Uh, the full set. Next slide, please. As this graphic shows, uh, there were a total of 539 CO deaths associated with these products from between 2000 and 2019. Uh, it's important to understand that CO exposure from gas furnaces and boilers is a hidden hazard because consumers can't see it, they can't smell it, they can't taste it. They don't know when it's occurring. Um, Next slide, please. As shown in this graphic, um, CPSC's economic staff estimated that there was an aggregate total of over 30,000 injuries associated with gas furnaces and boilers between 2014 and 2018. Uh, the remaining data provides a breakdown of how those injuries were treated, uh, whether it was an ER or treated in a doctor's office, the full gamut. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna discuss the hazard pattern and the actual hazard. So the hazard that we're attempting to address through this proposed rule is CO exposure and poisoning. Um, the patterns are, are twofold phenomena. Um, and we see this unfold uh, when we look at incident data, we see this unfold or it's supported by the testing and evaluation that we've done. Um, so the twofold aspect of this hazard deals with uh, incomplete combustion uh, of the air fuel mixture that's needed to burn and, and, and create heat for your home. Uh, what happens is if you have too much fuel, meaning too much gas, which can occur as a result of the unit, uh, the gas pressure being too high, and so it becomes overfired. So you're it's running rich and you're producing, you're providing too much fuel to burn completely. And so you produce CO that way. The other way in that equation is that you can have adequate gas flow, but you can have inadequate combustion air for combustion, which is needed to burn that air fuel mixture. And when you don't have enough air, um, that can also lead to incomplete combustion, which is when CO is produced. And what we see in our incident data is that oftentimes there are air openings in uh, boiler rooms or closets that are designed to provide adequate fresh air for combustion. Sometimes consumers will block those with furniture, uh, sometimes inside the uh, closet or where the appliance is located. Uh, there are things that reduce the space and the availability of adequate air for combustion. And in that case, that leads to uh, CO uh, production as well. And these are the types of things that we see that result in CO production. The other part of the hazard is the leakage path or the leakage mechanism. 
Uh, ideally, uh, CO is vented safely to the outdoors through a vent system. What we find in our incident data is that when we have these deaths and injuries or these exposures, uh, something happened to the vent system. Either it was disconnected, uh, the vent was partially blocked, or there are other phenomena, phenomena that lead to um, mechanisms that allow cause the CO to leak into the uh, living space. And I'll give you some more examples of those shortly. Next slide, please. Here's just a graphic of how these appliances are designed. And if you look at the pinkish um, graphic, the pinkish line, that, that depicts a uh, gas vent system. And so it depicts the, um, the exhaust path from the, from the furnace or the boiler uh, to the outdoors. And as long as that is intact, then you can safely vent the products out of the house. But as we said, uh, when it becomes detached or disconnected or there's a breach or anything that disrupts that in a certain way, then it can lead to um, the seal products leaking into the living space. Slide, please. And just by way of more examples, here are some uh, pictures just to show you a pictorial representation of what happens. Um, on the left, we have a disconnected vent. Um, it's it's almost self-explanatory um, what happens if the vent is no longer connected, so you don't have a gas tight fit. So instead of those products going through that vent system, they're gonna leak into the surrounding space. And that's what we see in our incidents. The middle picture is of a snow blockage of a sidewall vented appliance. Um, the standards currently have uh, provisions for a totally block fence protection for that. Uh, this is a phenomenon that has defeated the um, the totally block vent protection or the block vent shutoff system that exists in all gas appliances. Um, so this is not more proof that the leakage path um, that there are some limitations into the level of protection that you get by addressing the leakage path. And that's what we're trying to address through our proposed rule. Next slide, please. So the relevant uh, US voluntary standards for these products are the ANSI Z21 set of uh, gas appliance standards. Uh, for central furnaces, it's ANSI Z2147. Uh, for gas boilers, it's ANSI Z2113. And for uh, gas wall furnaces and floor furnaces, uh, it's ANSI Z2186. And I should note that that standard covers other appliances, but our scope only affects the, only includes these products because the coverage for those, as with the others, it doesn't adequately adequately protect against CO. Next slide, please. So our assessment of this are based on the fact that furnaces and boilers continue to be the second leading cause of CO poisoning deaths in the U.S. Um, and we also find that our review of the standards um, that they are not adequately they, that they don't adequately address the seal hazard because they don't protect against a lot of the known conditions which we just covered um, that occur and that we see in our incident reports. Next slide, please. We also reviewed uh, international standards for gas boilers and and water heaters. And those standards, we found that those standards include CO or combustion sensing uh, and monitoring devices that are designed to not only um, ensure um, proper efficiency, but they also protect against CO exposure uh, in similar ways that we have proposed in our draft proposed rule, which are they uh, monitor, they continuously monitor CO production or the, com or the combustion process but they also provide a means to shut the appliance down or to modulate its performance so that you can lower uh, the CO production in the appliance. Next slide, please. We've asked our uh, Office of Compliance to do a review um, of recalls associated with these products. And so between 2013 and 2022, um, they um, found that there were a total of nine um, recalls associated with gas boilers. Uh, these were seal-related recalls 
um, that resulted in over 120,000 units being recalled. Um, and essentially the recall uh, that was affected was a type of repair of the product to bring it up to speed to pre prevent it from producing or pre pre presenting a uh, CO exposure risk. Next slide, please. Back in August of 2019, um, we were pub CPSC published an advance notice of proposed uh, rulemaking uh, concerning the seal hazards that we're discussing today um, associated with furnaces and boilers. And the basis for that was the fact that the relevant voluntary standards don't adequately address the known hazards that we see in uh, our incidents and that we shared with the industry. Next slide, please. So there were a total of 15 uh, entities that responded to our AMPR. Uh, 13 of those entities opposed our rule, our proposed rule, or I'm sorry, they opposed the AM AMPR. Uh, two commenters supported the AMPR. Uh, and just to give you, a, just to give you uh, the reason cited for the opposition to the AMPR, uh, they among them included um, their preference to continue to rely on residential CO alarms. Um, they wanted to continue to rely on consumer and installer education. Um, they also wanted to rely on the existing voluntary standards and the standards process. Um, and concerns raised were that there could be unintended consequences of a shutdown of an appliance in the middle of winter, and that being frozen pipes, cold homes. Um, and then finally, uh, concerns were raised about the durability and the longevity of sensors operating in this very, admittedly, very harsh environment of a gas appliance. Next slide, please. So the draft proposed rule that staff developed states that gas furnaces and, and boilers shall be equipped with a means to monitor CO emissions directly or indirectly and cause the appliance to either one, shut down or to modulate its combustion when the CO levels exceed certain uh, levels. Next slide, please. So the draft proposed rule allows a multi-point or a single point method to determine that the appliance must shut down or modulate when dangerous levels of CO are produced in the appliance. The multi-point method requires a seal sensor um, to monitor several points. And I'll get into the basis for the, the points, the set points that we selected. Um, but uh, as you see in the, uh, in the chart here, um, we look at several points ranging from 150 parts per million um, up to 190 for 60 minutes. It's a lower exposure, so you have more time so we, they have, the consumer has more time to respond. As the exposure goes up, and so when you go to um, bullet A, where we're protecting against 500 parts per million or higher, the time is, uh, is shorter. Uh, so we only give it 15 minutes to respond to that condition because it's a more serious condition um, and we're trying to protect the consumer. After the modulation, in the case of modulation, uh, after the modulation begins, uh, the seal concentration within the appliance has to re be reduced to 150 parts per million within 50 within 15 minutes, reduced below to below 150 parts per million. And I think you understand when we provide our rationale for that shortly. Next slide, please. The other method or the other option that manufacturers have is what we call the uh, single point method, and essentially that just requires that the appliance either shut down or modulate uh, in response to a, a single seal concentration of 150 parts per million for 15 minutes. Again, so we're providing the lowest, or I should say the highest level of protection in that we're protecting against the lowest um, seal concentration of concern, but we're also uh, specifying a time limit so that if for whatever reason, there were a higher concentration that we protect against that as well. So we're kind of covering 
the multipoint method two ways by um, designing for the lowest concentration and also the lowest time um, exposure so that we're protected from low con lower concentrations as well as the higher concentrations. And again, as with the multipoint method, um, when modulation in the case of units that modulate, um, the requirement is that that we propose is that the unit, um, the seal concentrations within the unit should drop below 150 parts per million within 15 minutes. Next slide, please. So here we're gonna um, provide our rationale for the set points that we selected. The chart that you see, uh, we, we borrowed that from the UL 20, 2034, which is the seal alarm standard. Um, this is a, a, a chart that graphs car carbon monoxide concentration versus time. And what we based our shutoff and modulation times on in the seal concentration set points are the red dots on this curve, which correspond to what's called the, uh, the, the G curve, which is a 20% uh, carboxyhemoglobin level. And what we know from that is that if we can protect at that level along this curve, that we protect consumers from receiving any nothing more than a headache uh, if they have the misfortune of having an appliance that's producing dangerous levels of CO. Um, so again, this we uh, this corresponds to the twenty percent carboxyhemoglobin level. Uh, we find that higher carboxyhemoglobin levels result in more severe health effects, including death. So staff set this level to protect against the hazards that we see and the incidents that we look at uh, that involve serious CO injuries and deaths. Next slide, please. Another aspect of our proposed rule is a fail-safe provision that we included. And essentially that fail safe um, provision was born out of concerns raised about what would happen if a CO sensing device or a combustion control system failed in the dead of winter. Um, the appliance is still operating properly, but the sensor is not operating. So basically we require um, that if the sensor fails, that the unit should shut down and then restart after 15 minutes. By doing that, if there was any seal buildup that was not detected, we give the appliance the opportunity to shut down for the seal to be dispersed, and then it restarts. By restarting that, we, we, we protect the consumer from having a cold house or frozen pipes, and we don't penalize them for a, a sensor that failed. They still are provided heat, but this unit, uh, we require the unit to cycle on and off in these intervals um, at a reduced content at a, I'm sorry, at a reduced heating capacity. So that'll help the consumer understand that there's something going wrong with our equipment, that it's not heating properly, which we uh, believe would prompt them to go check the unit out. Uh, we also require a, a visual indicator of uh, trouble with the sensor. Um, so that entails either having a, a flashing light or a numeric code on the on the unit's control board, which all, all of them have control boards. That's how it operates. That's the uh, brains of the unit. And so if, if there's a problem with the unit, either from shutdown because it detected CL or shut down because the sensor failed, the, the, the consumer will be notified. And if and when they call a high back technician, they'll understand what's going on because there will be a flashing code I'm sorry, a flashing light or a numeric code that corresponds to uh, the trouble that's going on. This is a, a state of practice that's used in this industry uh, with other components, other shutoff devices. They um, either will provide a flashing light or a numeric code that corresponds to the problem or the trouble that they're having with the unit. Next slide, please. In terms of the effectiveness of our proposed rule, uh, staff assesses that the proposed rule will be between 90 and 100% effective in preventing CL deaths and injuries associated with gas furnaces and boilers. We make this, sense, we make this assessment on the following basis. 
The draft proposed rule mitigates CO at the source of production before it can leak into the living space and become a hazard. The other basis for this is that any CO production that the unit might produce would be limited to levels that produce a headache and expose consumers. And that goes back to the chart that I showed you that we're setting the set points for these for either a sensor or a combustion control device so that it never exceeds that concentration for that time. And it results in uh, lower um, health effects or fewer health effects. Uh, staff's research also demonstrates that the draft proposed rule is technologically feasible. This is further confirmed by European and Japanese industry compliance to international st uh, voluntary standards that address the seal hazard and that have seal monitoring or combustion process monitoring devices and the ability to shut off or modulate the performance. The Europeans and the Japanese are already doing what we've proposed. Next slide, please. The effective date. Now, staff assesses that it would not be feasible for manufacturers to comply with the draft proposed rule in 180 days or less. Staff assesses that the number of actions that the firms must take to comply with the draft proposed rule and the complexity of those actions cannot be reasonably planned, implemented, and tested before within 180 days. Nobody wants this rule more than I do. I know I'm but trust me, um, they need time to get this going. Um, that's my unpracticed, uh, unrehearsed two cents. Um, staff further assesses that an 18 month effective date is needed to maintain a sufficient supply of gas furnaces and boilers and to give them time to gear up. It's gonna take them time. Next slide, please. anti-stockpiling provision. Um, this draft proposed rule includes an anti-stockpiling provision that limits firms from manufacturing or importing non-compliant furnaces or boilers between the product publication of the final rule and the effective date. The anti-stockpiling provision is set using a base period and a rate that firms can manufacture or import at the level defined in the base period. Staff set the base period as a calendar year with the median manufacturing or importing volume in the 13 months before the final rule is published. Staff clarifies in this draft proposed rule that only months with a non-zero volume would be considered in the determination of the median month. Firms cannot manufacture or import non-compliant products at a volume greater than 106% of the base period in each of the first 12 months after the final rule is published and 112 and a half percent for the subsequent months until the effective date of the proposed rule. These rates are based on historical data on the growth rate of shipments for gas furnaces and boilers. Next slide, please. So this table shows the results of the regulatory analysis that economics our director for economic staff conducted. The results are presented in both annualized terms and on our per unit basis. For each, for each perspective, staff provided results for three discount rates, undiscounted or 0%, 3%, and 7%. Across all discount rates and in both annualized and a per, per unit basis, the cost of the draft proposed rule are greater than the benefits. If we look at the annualized results under a 3% discount rate, we can, we can see that annualized benefits are estimated to be uh, over $356 million, while costs are estimated to be over $602 million. This results in annualized net benefits of a negative $245 million. Uh, dollars. Or to put it another way, there are 59 sets of 59 cents of benefits for every dollar expended for the proposed rule. Our economic staff also conducted sensitivity analysis, and they found that when they performed this um, analysis, to I'm sorry, next did slide. I? I'm sorry. Next slide. I got ahead of myself. Let me restart that. Uh, so staff also performed. 
a sensitivity analysis to test certain parameters from the main regulatory analysis. The first sensitivity test doubled the VSL uh, for all mitigated deaths of children. This change increased the estimated annualized benefits by $15 million. The second sensitivity test included an assumption, included an assumption, an assumption that by 10 years after the effective date of the rule, firms would develop seal sensors that would not require re replacing, saving customers the cost from their, replace, from their replacement. This change decreased the estimated annualized cost by $73 million. When the staff ran both of these sensitivity tests at the same time, the net benefits increased by $144 million and the benefit cost ratio increased from uh, 59 cents on the dollar to 78 cents on the dollar. And that's getting it close to um, unity. Next slide, please. So to summarize, um, we just want to reiterate that gas furnaces and boilers have accounted for 539 CO deaths um, for between 2000 and 2019, and we want to address that. Uh, the voluntary standards for these products are not adequate because they do not address conditions known to cause or contribute to CO poisoning. Um, in addition, uh, we, we feel that we developed or we, we developed a comprehensive rule, proposed rule, that addresses the CO hazards at the source of production before it has a chance to become a hazard. So we're trying to prevent this from happening. Staff assesses that the proposed rule would be 95% effective at mitigating CO hazards in these products. We also uh, were emboldened by the fact that there are international standards that are very similar to what we propose that have very similar uh, provisions, have very pre similar pre preventive and protective measures. And finally, uh, staff estimates that the cost to implement this proposed rule would be $89 per unit. And so, we uh we thank you for your time and consideration and that concludes our briefing this morning and we are glad to entertain any questions you might have thank you very much mr jordan mr di matteo i appreciate the comprehensive briefing that you just gave us at this point in time we're going to turn to questions from the commission um 10 minute rounds and i'm going to start with myself um again thank you for the briefing that you gave just to um go a little bit more into the, the technology they're talking, make sure, make sure that I understand it. Um, you talked that uh, for the ones that are modulating that it would shut off at different points, but shut off after 15 minutes. If the level of CO is remains high at the end of that 15 minute period of time, what happens at that point for the sensor? Does it just not allow the furnace to turn on or does it turn on, on and turn off immediately? Good question. Uh, in the case of modulation, um, it, to be clear, um, the unit would not shut off. Essentially, modulation, um, I have to get into the weeds a little bit to answer your question. So, modulation encompasses um, controlling um, the air fuel ratio. And essentially, that's accomplished by either having the ability to increase the fan speed, the blower, I'm um, sorry, the inducer motor or the power venter. There are different fans on these units that pull or push the combustion products through the vent system. So modulation would have a means to increase that fan speed to over to compensate for lack of adequate combustion air. The problem is that we're if we're starved for air, we have to bring more air in and that's accomplished by increasing the fan speed directly to the combustion process so that you have adequate air for combustion and that you don't um, get into an incomplete combustion condition. The other aspect of modulation increase involves adjusting the um, the gas pressure to the unit. Again, that's a few part of the equation. Um, oftentimes what we see in our incidents is that these units are overfired, meaning that they have too much fuel and so that they're not gonna burn completely and they produce CO. So with modulation, you can either inc uh, control the air to the combustion process by increasing or decreasing the fan speed 
but you can also increase or decrease the gas flow to the combustion process by increasing or decreasing the gas pressure. And so modulation would only encompass adjusting one of those two elements so that you have proper combustion, you have the proper air fuel ratio in the, in the product. So it would not shut down, it would just adjust. Now, if for whatever reason you modulate it and it didn't bring the unit down to the prescribed limits, it would just continue to modulate. Now, that there would be a trouble signal or error code associated with that. It's the same uh, mech through the same mechanism that we deal with the fail safe and also the shut off. So in that case, add to that quickly, just to make it maybe a little simpler from my understanding mm -hmm. of working on this for those who might not be versed in all the engineering of it. I think really what Ron's trying to say is this system is set up in such a way that it's self correcting. So it never, it shouldn't get to the point where yes. you're above a level that's unsafe because the, the way that it's engineered and set up, it constantly makes adjustments to make sure that doesn't happen. Correct me if I'm wrong about that. You're correct. And if it does go to an unsafe level, what would happen at that point in time with the modulating system? It will continue to modulate, and it's, so it's working to bring the CO concentration down to a safe level. And at so, some point in time, presumably, that either means that there's no fuel going in if it can't modulate or hot? No, it would just adjust, and you would have this uh, continuous cycling um, where it's making efforts it's uh, stopping the cycle in order to adjust the CO levels. But we're comfortable in the end of the day with the, with the sensor that it will be keeping it down below the levels that are um, creating a hazard for the consumers. Yes, we, we believe so. And remember, um, so there are two parts to CO exposure. It's the concentration that we're trying to protect against, but it's also the time that you're exposed to it. By by shutting down or you know cycling off, I should say, during modulation, that gives a, the appliance the opportunity to uh, disperse the CO that's in it, in the uh, in the vent pipe and in the combustion chamber, bring it back down to uh, normal levels. I would expect that when it when it shuts down for fifteen minutes, that the levels will come down. And I base that in part on. I've, I've actually, I'm not just a project manager. I've been in the laboratory and I've done this and seen it um, demonstrated. Thank you. Um, as you noted at the end uh, and under our uh, rules, we, we have to bear a reasonable, the, the benefits of the rule have to bear a reasonable relationship to the costs. Um, what's staff's basis for assessing that this notice at this uh, stage that there is such a relationship? I'm going to defer to our <laughs> economist here. Do I have it right? Alex. Right, it's good. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, Alex Moscoso, Associate Executive Director for the Economic Analysis Directed. I think I can help with this question. <clears throat> so, uh, staff recognizes that the uh, costs uh, are, as estimated, are larger than the benefits. Uh, I think some, uh, some key facts to point out from the briefing packages that uh, shown in the sensitivity analysis, that gap in benefits and costs shrinks as the technology develops that extends the life of the CO sensor closer to the life of the of the actual furnace, uh, reducing the amount of times it has to be replaced or um, potentially not having it replaced at all. And um, also in relationship to the price of a gas furnace or boilers, the net cost per unit of uh, $64.51 is relatively small when you compare it to a price of a, of a furnace, which is around $1,600. Price of a boiler, it's around $3,400. Um, so this, you know, this is a hidden hazard, um, and this technology has the potential to possibly shrink the gap and, and, and eliminate uh, this hidden hazard, um, depending on what happens with the technology going forward. They're saying about $64 you're eliminating between, I believe you said around 90, 90% to hundred percent of the deaths associated with this. Correct. That's net cost. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, turn over to my fellow commissioners, commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, thank you, Mr. Jordan, uh, Mr. DiMatteo, uh, uh Mr. Moscoso for, for all your work uh, on the package and. Uh, Mr. Jordan, in particular, this has been a, a, a long-standing issue that uh, that you've been out in front of, and uh, thank you for not just this, but all your work uh, that, that's led us here today. Uh, I do have a couple questions. Um, 
And I'll start with uh, ANSI uh, Z21. So that suite of uh, existing ANSI standards, uh, you expressed your concerns uh, uh, about them, uh, but I'm curious what, if anything, that suite of standards does in terms of addressing CO, if, if anything. Okay, uh, that's a good question. So all of the gas appliance standards, and, and these in particular, uh, have uh, combustion limits, emission limits. So they specify that the product should not produce more than 400 parts per million in an air-free flu sample. Um, that's one provision. The weakness in that is that that's, that test and that assessment is done in the factory. Um, there's no means to ensure that when they're out in commerce, that it can still keep the, the emissions level below that, that limit. That's one aspect of it. The other things that they do. Um, so they don't account for variations in installation. Is that. No, no, it's um, no, they just do emissions testing um, either at a, um, a testing agency or at the manufacturing plant. Um, but, and that's good because coming off the line, um, they're well tuned um, and they will pass the standard. The problem that we see is when they get out in commerce, when they get into people's homes, that there's no means to ensure that they remain at those safe levels. Um, given all of the things that can happen in a home, whether it's a vent becoming disconnected, whether it's a unit being installed improperly, whether it's a, a inherent defect that came from the plant, there are various and sundry things that can happen and we see them happen. Um, they're demonstrated in our hazard analysis and other reports that we've done where we've looked at incident data and try to understand what was going on. Um, so there, it's almost like I used the um, the little Dutch boy in the dike example that the approach that's taking now is like trying to plug holes in a in a in a dike. The problem is you can plug one hole, but another one will pop up and you have there's not a means to protect against that. We we feel that by addressing the hazard at the source of production, that that's the most comprehensive and complete way to protect against a wide range of things that happen out in the field. Um, the other things that, the um, the other protections that, the, to answer your question, the other protections that these standards have are what are known as block vent shutoff provisions. And that requires that if the vent pipe is completely blocked, that the unit will shut down after a certain amount of time. It's normally 15 minutes or less. Which is good, but there are no provisions or inadequate provisions for partially blocked appliances, and that will vary uh, how well a unit shuts down in response to that. There's also um, the 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 vent disconnected vent condition, which, and this was before my time, but back in the '80s, in the late '80s, there were provisions on uh, there. Were, there was a lot of activity going in on on these particular standards. Um, they had a uh, disc, uh, I'm sorry, a vent safety shutoff uh, protection for gas furnaces and boilers, but then they removed it because there was some interference that they were experiencing with uh, vent dampers. So they removed that protection, but there is nothing to replace it. Okay, um, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to ask about the Japanese and European standards. Um, uh, the DC Circuit in the recent WCMA decision. Uh, took issue with CPSC's argument that a truncated effective date was justified uh, in part because of the existence of substantially similar Canadian standards. Um, because the standards weren't exactly the same, the court found that it wasn't fair to assume that industry compliance with the foreign standard would satisfy the requirements of a CPSC standard uh, to justify a, a shorter effective date. Now, I, I want to be clear, I'm not asking for your opinion uh, about any potential vulnerabilities that the, the proposed rule might have. Uh, that's a question that I'll ask in closed session. Uh, but I would like to get a sense uh, for, from you about how what we're proposing today is different from uh, what what's currently in place in in Japan and in, in Europe. And it, it sounds like, you know, we, we, you may be talking about the existence of a Japanese standard and a European standard um, is a basis for, um, you know, technological feasibility. And I understand that, but getting sort of a crosswalk between what what is being proposed today and, and what's currently in place would, uh, would, would, would be useful. Right. I think I understand your question. Um, 
to be clear, um, when we when we reference the international standards, we're not saying in their totality that this is what should be done, but there are provisions within the international standards and um, the CEN standards, the European standards. Um, they have provisions for, they call it continuous um, supervision of the, of the CO products or the combustion process. Well, that's continuous monitoring of the process because if you want to, if you want to control something, you have to monitor it. And if you're going to monitor it, you have to be where that substance is located. And in this case, that substance, the combustion products, the CO are located in the combustion chamber and the heat exchanger and the flue passageways all the way up to the point that the vent system exits the house. So the similarities are that, um, if I'm understanding your question correctly, is that we're looking, we're also posing that manufacturers be required to have incorporate continuous monitoring of CO in the combustion process. Because I know of no other way that you can protect against that unless you monitor it. The other part that's similar is that when the, um, at, while you're monitoring the CO concentration or that combustion process, that when they exceed a certain set point, your, your target concentration that you want to protect against and have something safe happen, that they propose limits for that, and we do the same. So that's where the similarities uh, exist. After beyond that, you know, um, you, and, and our focus on the European and the Japanese standards were only on those provisions, um, and those are the things that we looked at and said that hey, these are similar to what we're doing because they they allow for a continuous monitoring of the condition that we're trying to protect against. And they have a uh, proactive action to protect against it, either to shut it down or to modulate to drop the levels back to safe levels. Okay, but the, what's being proposed isn't isn't a, a one for one identical with with what we're seeing in international no, no, standards. Okay. No, I mean I think that our pro our proposal um, reflects our knowledge of the U.S. voluntary standards, so we use some of the language because they're going to be the end ideally if our draft proposed rule is adopted they would be the end users and so they would it needs to be written in a language that they understand okay uh, thank you for this and, and mr jordan thank you for all, all your work on this issue uh going back some time now appreciate it thank you my pleasure thank you mr tronka uh, thank you for your work on addressing this hazard and thank you for the clear presentation this morning so what I'm hearing from staff is that we've got a hazard that kills 27 people a year. It's been doing that for decades, that voluntary standards are inadequate to save those lives, that technology exists that can save those lives, and that other countries have already addressed this. And the proposal you put forward is expected to save between 90 and 100% of the lives that are currently at risk. I'd say that's beyond compelling. So thank you for the work that got us here so far. Um, I do want to make sure I understand one element of how the proposal works. So so uh, the, the chair asked you about uh, one of the shutoff scenarios where you go to the modulation option. I think I understand the scenario where the sensor fails and, and that goes to the 15 minute restart. So let's put that one aside. Let's put the modulation aside for a sec, which which could include cycling off. But the other option for for high CO levels is is a shutoff. And so if that shutoff happens, what happens next? Does, does it automatically restart? Uh, how's the consumer alerted in that scenario? Right. So the consumer well, wouldn't, the standards as are written and we didn't address that, but manufacturers can allow for either um, automatic restart or a manual restart. Um, that's, a, that's a manufacturer's choice. Um, in terms of how the consumers are notified, if it shuts down in the middle of winter, they're going to know that it's off because they're going to have a cold house. Um, and I would expect that they would go and investigate their unit. They'll probably uh, hit the thermostat. Nothing happens. They'll go down to the basement or wherever it's located and look to find, see if it's operating. Uh, they may or may not see the flashing light, depending on how 
and depth they want to look at it. And then I would expect that they would call a service technician who would come out and check the unit out. Our requirement requires our, our proposed rule, our draft proposed rule requires that there be a um, either a flashing light or a numeric code that corresponds to the um, the to the trouble condition that's going on with the unit. And again, that's the current state of practice that manufacturers use with other safety shutoff devices, with other operational devices that affect the operation of the appliance. If it fails or has a dysfunction that on the control board, again, the brains of the unit, that this is where the technician would look to find out what's going on. Um, okay. And, and, you know, so we treat this situation differently than we treat the shutoff because the sensors failed. There you don't necessarily, or you wouldn't have a CO hazard at that moment. So restart might make sense there, but we wouldn't want automatic restart if there is a CO hazard. Uh, is is that fair to to say? That's very fair. Okay, so um, th there's also a rise in the popularity uh, of smart thermostats. Uh, I know when I recently replaced my furnace, I, they didn't even give me an option. That's what they put in, even though I didn't want it. So, so where those are present, could we also require in any of these shutoff scenarios? Could we also require it to to alert on those smart thermostats or on the apps that control them? I, I think that that's um, the way that technology is going, but we as a team haven't looked at that particular uh, concept yet. Okay. I, I would hope that seems like an area ripe for comment um, during the comment period. And I would hope we get some good comments on that issue for us to think through. Um, you know, there's also a line in the package that I think is worth emphasizing. And, and you say that there are, uh, quote, approximately 2 million gas furnaces and 800,000 gas boilers uh, without CO sensors are sold each year, thus prolonging the time it would take to replace old stock. As a result, each year of further delay in instituting safety features to address the CO hazard will result in millions of units without these features being sold and installed in remaining homes for multiple decades, risking additional preventable deaths and injuries. A and I think it's an important point that once these get in our homes, they could be there for decades. Yes. Uh, and also these aren't usually planned purchases. You know, when your furnace goes out, you're going to buy a new furnace uh, pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so demand is pretty inelastic on this point. And, and I think we should be very cautious about delaying the benefits of this rule any more than necessary. Uh, because I hate that if someone's furnace broke seven months after a rule was promulgated here, that they'd have to be forced to buy uh, a furnace without a CO shutoff and have that in their home for 20 years or more. Um, because our rule wasn't in effect. So for that reason, I'm going to pay very close attention to any comments that we get advocating for a shorter effective date, particularly something within our typical six month range. Um, and, and, and again, I will say the substance of this package, I have no more questions on the substance. It is very sound. I think that the economic analysis portion of the package might have some catching up to do. And there's a line in the analysis that says, quote, in the first year, Producer manufacturing costs are expected to increase by $22.08 per gas furnace, causing a $70.44 per unit in higher retail costs to the consumer in the form of higher retail prices. And there's a similar assessment for gas boilers. And I'm particularly confused by that. You know, personally, I, I think it's, I don't think a responsible company should pass any increased costs on to consumers just to make their products safe. But I understand that they do, and let's assume that they do. So, so normally they would pass on some of the cost to consumers and absorb some of the cost themselves. So here, if we accept that, manufacturing costs should increase by $22.08. Um, consumers should only face increased costs of $22.08 or less. Instead, the economic analysis assumes manufacturers will price gouge consumers by an extra $50. I think it would be unconscionable for companies to raise prices more than their cost of compliance with a safety rule. And I think there's no place for baking corporate profit gouging into our economic analysis. I believe those assumptions need to be corrected in our final rule package, and I would hope not to see them replicated in any rule package that comes before the commission. I'd also like to highlight the room for growth that I see on the benefit side of the analysis. And, and let's start with an important one, jobs. The largest share of the costs of this rule come from an increased need for maintenance. That type of work is a vital part of the U.S. economy, 
How many new maintenance jobs would this rule create, Mr. Moscoso? I don't know that information, sir. You know, I think we need to know that information because if we're saying the cost of, of this rule is driven up by the increased need for maintenance, implying, you know, uh, uh, adding a, a new CO sensor if the first one goes, it's important to value that benefit. Uh, and, and I think we should think through that, and I'd really like to get comments on that issue if we could. There's also growing evidence on the effects of chronic exposure to low levels of CO, including well-documented cases of illness caused by chronic CO exposure from home heating appliances. In fact, the briefing package describes the adverse chronic health effects of CO at low levels on pages OS 85 and OS 193. So is it safe to say that this rule could have additional health benefits of helping to reduce negative health outcomes from chronic CO exposure? Um, we. As a team, we didn't look at that. Uh, I'd have to consult with our, uh, our health scientists to get that analysis. Uh, we were focused on the acute hazards uh, as opposed to the chronic uh, hazards and, and benefits for that reason. Um, so I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay, and, and I understand that. I mean, the, the chronic ha or the acute hazards here are staring us in the face. Um, but as we do with the cost benefit analysis, I think it'd be helpful to consider all the possible benefits here. Uh, that that being a potential one of them. So I'd hope that's an area we get comments on as well. And I'd invite those. Um, with CO poisoning in a home, we can also see multiple fatalities at once, and we've read about that uh, that happening. Perhaps even an entire family dying in their sleep, and all deaths are obviously terrible. But there's something particularly awful thinking about an entire family poisoned at once that's maybe greater than the sum of those parts. How should we think about intangible benefits like avoiding those types of catastrophic outcomes? Um, well, I think that, yeah, that, that gets to the heart of what we do here at CPSC. I mean, we're trying to protect consumers and Yes, I've seen those tragedies. I've seen entire families wiped out by this hazard from these products. Um, how do we how do we address that? I'm I'm not sure if I understand your question. I, I think specific, and I know you want to avoid those as much as anyone here. Um, but I think what I mean is in the cost benefit analysis. How do we address those? How do we ascribe intangible benefit of avoiding something that's worse than the sum of those individual deaths? Oh, okay. I'm going to defer to Alex on that one. Um, you know, the intangible benefits um, are usually described qualitatively in the cost benefits analysis. We try to quantify what we can where we there's a set methodology. Those are difficult to quantify benefits and to the extent that we can, we try to describe them qualitative, qualitatively what we couldn't quantify. Okay, and, and you know, if there's a way to quantify these, another thing that I would hope we could get some some help. I'm going to wrap up just say, um, uh, that we could get some some helpful comments on, and we could take those into consideration. Because I think what we've got here is a rule that has tremendous benefits, and I want to make sure that we capture all of them when we're doing that assessment. Um, because I'm drawn back to those 27 lives that this proposal is designed to save every year going forward. And when we're talking about products that not only cost us thousands of dollars but that we rely on for basic comforts, well, we need to also be able to rely on those not putting us at risk. So I thank you for your work and for your efforts to getting us to this point, and I look forward to moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Wall. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Jordan, Mr. DiMatteo, Mr. Moscoso, for your presentation. It was very um, informative, and I thank you for your work over the many years uh, that you've dedicated to this issue. I do want to bring you back to a discussion of the voluntary standards that I believe Commissioner Feldman uh, addressed, and I think you talked about specifically what those standards do to address the hazard. But I want to take a bit of a step back and just ask, how long have we been participating with the voluntary standards um, organizations on this issue? Well, CPSC, um, I think pretty much since its inception, uh, for me personally, um, I came in 91 and February and in November of that year, I was at a voluntary standard meeting in Cleveland. And historically, throughout my entire career, I mean, we've dealt with other hazards such as uh, fire and uh, gas leaks and explosions. But throughout the years, we've always dealt with CO. And so I would say that we've been engaged with the voluntary standards on this issue uh, my entire time here and, be and be before I got here. 
Um, how we addressed it uh, changed a little bit in 2000. Uh, we had spent, we had previously been trying to uh, address what I call the leakage path uh, mechanism and to get industry to address the fact that they didn't no longer had protection in the standard that protected against disconnected vents. And then um, in 2000 that we realized that, well, again, we uh, realized that we can't plug all the holes in a dike. It's better, let's stop the hazard at the source. And so we moved away, we shifted away from trying to propose, make proposals in the voluntary standards to address the leak. And we revised them to um, ask industry to adjust the hazard at the source. And so it's been 22 years. Uh, we made, made that proposal back in 2000. Um, I will add that during that time, because uh, we've made two proposals uh, since 2000, we made one in 2000, um, asking industry to address this issue. Uh, they set up a working group that um, um, that was established for about three years, and then it was disbanded with no changes in the standard. Uh, we continue to conduct testing and evaluation and, and participate in the voluntary standards process, sharing our work with industry. And then uh, we had a, a, a CO sensor forum back in 2014. We invited industry in, uh, we shared the results of that. And then we made another proposal in 2015. Yet again, another working group was set up to consider our proposal. Um, but that one uh, lasted for about four years, and then it was disbanded without um, any uh, new standards being adopted. Okay. And so during that span, just to put it in perspective, during that span from 2000 through 2019 are when those 539 deaths occurred. I appreciate that. So uh, you may have already answered this, but when my follow up question was to ask you, how would you characterize the level of progress and cooperation uh, over the period that you've been working on this issue? Yes, now, unfortunately, I, I don't see any progress. I have not seen any progress in the 22 years um, that we've worked on this issue. Um, and I would add that I don't see, I don't anticipate anything occurring because nothing's happened to this point. Okay, thank you for that. And just specifically, I wanted to ask, I understand there were concerns about the availability and feasibility of sensor technology. Uh, can you explain what the basis of those concerns were, uh, given that I think you've said that those, that technology technology was available in the Japanese and European standards? Right, so the issue that the industry raised with us when we first made this proposal way back in 2000, and we supported the proposal, I'll add, uh, with testing and evaluation, we uh, we did proof of concept testing in the laboratory with sensors integrated into working furnaces and demonstrated that you can shut, that you can monitor CO and you can shut down a response. Um, the issue or the, I think the red line in the sand that industry has drawn is that they feel, or their concern is that sensors aren't durable enough to survive in this very harsh uh, environment of a gas appliance. We're talking um, the, the combustion gases that are being burned. Uh, we're talking about high temperatures up upwards of 500 degrees Fahrenheit and, and very high, very wet uh, conditions, very humid. And those things can have an impact on a sensor if it's not designed properly. Um, so their concern is that sensors um, weren't durable enough to survive in that environment and that they didn't last at the estimated 20 year life of the appliance. Well, I've been in meetings where uh, people, uh, members from industry have anecdotally explained how their appliance lasted 25 years. And they proceeded to tell me like, well, we replace this part and that part and this other part. And that's with most products, whether it's a car or whether it's an appliance whether it's a gas furnace or a boiler, the individual components are going to fail. And with other component, as with other components, you just replace them. If your igniter fails, you replace it. If your pressure switch fails, you replace it, your gas valve, so on and so forth. Um, so I didn't agree with their argument um, because it, it, they made an argument that was different than what the facts were and how they typically handle other failed components. 
Okay, thank you. I appreciate that answer. And, and just on the uh, um, proposed requirement, I do want to just drill down on that a bit. So you're, there's a choice, right? There's either a shutoff or an intermittent shutoff is how I'm looking at it. Um, why wouldn't you just recommend a complete shutoff? Isn't that more protective for consumers? Well, uh, we didn't want to be re design restrictive. And we know that from what we've seen in Europe and Japan that, yeah, they do have working devices and understanding how those devices work, that they're looking at um, basically the ones that modulate are responding to the air fuel mixture not being at the proper level. Okay. And when the air fuel ratio, the air, the mixture of air to fuel are imbalanced, that's when you fall into incomplete combustion and that's when you um, start developing CO. If you have complete combustion, you're not going to develop CO. You're not going to produce CO. Okay. So our proposal allows for direct measurement and monitoring of CO, but it also allows for these other innovative and effective technologies. And looking at and monitoring the air fuel ratio is one of them. Um, and so I think that it gives manufacturers more options um, to uh, address the problem. Okay, I appreciate that answer. So then if, if intermittent shutoff, uh, as I'm calling it, is selected, I'm wondering why it, there's a recommendation to either fulfill that requirement through the multi-point system or to the single point at 150 uh, ppm. Can you explain why you, it seems to me that the just the 150 ppm, 15 minutes is the most protective and so why we wouldn't select that as just the single um, direction. Right. And again, uh, not knowing um, the design approaches that different manufacturers, um, appliance or sensor manufacturers may take, uh, this gives, I think, maximum flexibility so that they can look at the multi-point or the single point. Um, they both are, would be equally effective. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about that because I thought I heard you say before that at the 500 level, it's a more serious condition uh, uh, than at the 150, which makes sense to me. So why, and they're both at 15 minutes. So if you could just maybe clarify why they're, they are the same level of protection. Right. So again, it's important to understand um, it would probably help if we could put up one of the slides um, if possible, and I can show you while I tell you. If you can hear me in the back, could you please put back up? I'm sorry, slide number with the curve. Have it in front of me. Slide okay. number 23. Okay. So the multi point method is derived from the red dots on that chart. Okay. And those red dots all fall on the um, what's called the uh, the twenty percent COHB curve or the carboxyhemoglobin curve. So basically, our approach is saying that by having a uh, performance requirement that addresses CO production at each one of those points on the curve, that we're protecting consumers from uh, experiencing experiencing anything more than a headache. Um, so why have the two approaches? It just gives uh, maximum flexibility um, because there are there could be unforeseen reasons why one approach would be better, but we wanted to offer them all and we give them the option because okay. they'll both accomplish the same thing. It's just how do they want to approach it? Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I see I'm out of time. Um, Need more time? No, I'm I'm good. Thank you. I just do appreciate all the work over these many years. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I don't believe there's a request for a second round of questions, and I also don't believe that there is a request for a um, closed session. Um, so I turn back to the staff. Thank you again for the presentation today. Um, it's clear, Mr. Jordan, that you are deeply involved in this for a long time and have a depth of knowledge that I appreciate you sharing with us um, and appreciate your dedication over time, as well as the rest of the team as well, those who aren't here. Um, so, with that, uh, I'd like to say thanks again for, to the commissioners and their active participation. Thanks to the facilities and communications staff and the Office of Secretary for assisting in this briefing. And with that, this briefing is adjourned.
Thank you. Thank you, Dave.